Hi, I'm Ben, welcome back to my channel. Somehow we're already halfway through October and on the home straight to the end of the year. I didn't do a wrap up in August, so I haven't done one for a while, but for the sake of completeness, I'm gonna run through everything that I read in August and September in the video today. My reading, as you probably are well aware, has been very dominated by Booker Prize reading recently, but don't worry, I'm not gonna be reviewing the long list again. You are probably sick of the booker, I know I am. I do have a series of videos where I go into in-depth reviews of the different books, and then I've got a ranking video where I breeze through all of them from my least favorite to my most favorite and do some shortlist predictions and stuff like that. If you haven't seen those videos and you do wanna watch them, I'll put a link to each of them in the description. But I did do some other reading. When I went on holiday at the start of August to Sicily, I took four books with me, I read three of them. So I read Mouth to Mouth by Antoine Wilson, which was okay for the plane ride. I read The Dry Heart by Natalia Ginsberg, which I really enjoyed, and Crudo by Olivia Lang, which I really loved my time with. It was really interesting. And to be honest, I was quite surprised by how relevant and thought provoking it still was. However, I'm not gonna review those books in depth in this video because I do have a vlog from the Italy holiday still to edit and share with you. So do keep an eye out for that. I'm doing quite badly with that really because that holiday was nearly two months ago and the temperatures have now plummeted in the UK. So maybe it's nice that you're gonna get a slice of summer in October or even early November, but yeah, that will be coming very soon. So if I'm not talking about the Booker Prize books, and I'm not talking about my holiday reads. What am I gonna talk about? Well, I do have four other books that I read, uh, mostly in September that I'd like to review, starting with Open Throat by Henry Hoke. This book is told from a really interesting perspective, a mountain lion that lives a little bit downhill from the Hollywood sign in Los Angeles. It's told in short bursts of thought. There's a lot of white space on the page, lots of line breaks and things like that. We're in the mind of a creature acting on instinct, acting and reacting to the world around him. For the most part, he's just an observer of people. He preys on smaller creatures, but he watches people with both a curiosity and a bloodlust. He somehow learned to understand the language. He doesn't speak English, but he can understand what people are saying. And he puzzles over the way people behave, what they do and say and why. I really enjoyed the writing with this one. I loved it being in the lion's head and it was frequently amusing. Not necessarily laugh out loud, it's not a comedy, but lots of the lines and observations made me smile. For me, it was a novel about the human condition and it has a lot of ideas baked in about climate change and humans' treatment of animals, about nature and nurture and the foibles of being a person. But it also has a clear plot with a satisfying arc and I really appreciated it for that. This book has been described as the story of a queer mountain lion. And I think there's been a bit of pushback on that because it's not super overtly in your face queer, but he fantasizes about another male lion that was kind to him once. And he also shows no resistance when he meets a girl who thinks he's a female lion and refers to him using female pronouns. To me, it felt pretty queer, but maybe that was a reaction to the reaction if that makes any sense. Overall, I really enjoyed this one. It's a quick little read. You could read it in a day if you wanted. I read it over the course of a weekend. But yeah, I'd recommend it. It's a lot of fun, but it also makes you think. Next, I read a book I'd really been anticipating, which was This Is How You Lose the Time War. Um, this is by two authors actually, writing in collaboration, Amor El Mota and Max Gladstone. This is a pretty short science fiction book that won the 2020 Hugo Award for Best Novella and seems to be pretty widely loved on Booktube and Bookstagram and all the social media platforms. So I've been meaning to get to it for years and was highly anticipating anticipating my time with it. This is kind of an enemies to lovers romance set against the backdrop of a future where time travel has been discovered and there's a war taking place across time between future factions of humanity, the organic garden and the cyberkinetic agency. I hope I've remembered those right. Anyway, red is part of the garden and blue is an agent of the agency. They carry out espionage, they're basically spies and they do this on behalf of their different factions and they come into contact with one another through letters. These are at first pretty competitive and boastful letters full of hubris, but they realize that they're kindred spirits. Their letters become poetic, effusive declarations of love and longing, despite them not actually properly meeting or having any physical intimacy. It's essentially a sci-fi Romeo and Juliet, which was a parallel I enjoyed until it is explicitly pointed out by one of the characters, which 
kind of lessened the subtlety. There is a lot of complicated world building right at the start. Much of what's described is kind of confusing or impenetrable. I think purposefully so, but it reveals itself over time. And actually the science fiction element becomes more secondary to the romance. I really wanted to like this. And there are definitely things I did enjoy. I'm a sucker for anything timey-wimey and I do really like the concept. I think it's fun and interesting and an engaging moment to moment. It has some good fun, particularly with historical events and figures without being too cheesy with it. However, while what I did find out about the rules of this universe was interesting, I'd have liked to see it go a little bit further. It ultimately felt a bit too underdeveloped for me. And to be totally honest, the love letters just weren't my bag. I found them quite overwrought and they pushed the sci-fi elements into the background too much. The ending is legitimately great, but it wasn't enough to make this anything more of like a three star read for me. I do find it really interesting though that this has two authors and I'd love to know how they worked together. There is like an author's note or acknowledgements at the back where they both share their thoughts. Um, but they don't really go into how the book came about and how they worked on it. Like, I want to know, did one of them just write all of red sections and their letters and one of them write blues? Or did they collaborate in some other way? If anyone out there knows if there's been any interviews or anything where they've gone into this a bit more, I'd be really interested to read it or watch it. So please do let me know. Yeah, overall, fine. I think the balance between the romance and the sci-fi just didn't massively work for me in the end. Okay, next I read Idol Burning by Rinusami, translated from the original Japanese by Asa Yaneda, who really interestingly lives in Bristol, which is where I live, and I think that's really cool. This book came out a few years ago in Japan, and I think it won a big literary prize. I can't remember the name of that prize, but it ended up being the biggest selling book in Japan that year, which... I don't know too much about the Japanese publishing industry, but that seems like a really big achievement because Japan has, from the outside at least, a really thriving literary scene with a lot of amazing authors and a lot of readers. So I went into this with quite high expectations. The story is about a girl called Akari, who I believe is a neurodivergent teenager who struggles at school, both socially and academically. Outside of school though, she is a super fan of a Japanese boy band, and in particular, one member called Makari, and she's really good at that. Makari is her Oshi, which is a term used to describe someone you support or want to see succeed. Her Oshi has become a really important part of her life. His colour in the band is blue, so she really likes blue things. She decorates her room with blue items. She spends all her money on merchandise and tickets, often buying duplicates of things to show more support. She also runs a blog dedicated to Makari and has attracted lots of other followers interested in her fandom. However, However, and this isn't a spoiler because it happens right at the start of the book, but one day the press reports that Makari's punched a fan and it throws the fandom into meltdown. It impacts his position in the band. So for instance, there's like this fan vote that is supposed to determine who gets the most solo vocals in the next album. And it also impacts Akari standing in the fandom of the band. Her blog gets a little bit less attention and she also gets a few more snarky comments from people who are fans of Makari's bandmates. There's not really any particularly huge plot arc here, but it does paint a very interesting and convincing picture of the mindset and thought processes of superfans. I personally often struggle to understand stan culture, where people dedicate huge amounts of their time to a particular singer or a movie star, running like fan accounts on social media and seeming to do little else than discuss their work or personal life. It seems to me like a tremendous waste of time. But this book does do really well to create some understanding and empathy, showing the community that's built and the way it can funnel individuals' passion into these creative endeavours. I'm not about to run out and create a fan account of my own, although if I did, it would be for Beyonce. And I do wish we lived in a world where people had opportunities for expressing their creativity and passion without needing to resort to idolising someone. But I do have a little bit more empathy now having read this book. One lovely detail actually is that in the author's note, Rinasami speaks about the book being an act of empathy for her brother who shares some characteristics with Akari. It helps position this book as a response to social exclusion in Japan, which we might see as the wellspring from which fandoms emerge as people try to find community. Overall, I wouldn't say I love this book, but it was a fun and thought-provoking little read. Okay, the last book I read this month was The Swimmers by Julie Otsuka. This is the first book I've read by Otsuka, and it's been on my radar because I'd seen it tipped for various prizes, 
And although ultimately it didn't appear on any of the long lists it was being predicted for, I was really intrigued by the premise. This is, at the start of the book at least, a story about the members of a local swimming pool. The first section is told in the collective first person, so we, and we get bombarded with lots of names and job titles and funny witty asides expressing the points of view of all the members of the pool about the goings on um, in their community. Funnily enough, now that I think about it, it does have quite a lot of thematic commonality with idle burning. It's about the community that can emerge around an interest, in this case, a swimming pool. It also deals with a crisis. The swimming pool doesn't punch someone in the face, but uh, it does get a hairline crack at the bottom. And people really freak out about it. There are conspiracy theories and people who are really interested in it, people who just want out straight away, they don't even want to take the risk, other people who are far more optimistic. What I loved about this section was its humour and how it seems to be both about the crack in the pool, but also the crack in our larger world, the climate crisis and social dysfunction. It has a lot to say and it does it with so much warmth. I mentioned that lots of names are thrown at you as a reader and you don't actually have to remember many of them. Most are only mentioned once or twice. But one that recurs is Alice, who is an older woman who appears to be struggling with her memory. After this first section, we pivot to telling her more singular story or realize it was her story from the beginning. The second section is told in the third person, focusing on Alice and her experience of losing her memory. And then the third section is told in the second person, from the perspective of a care facility called Bella Vista. It's all darkly comic. It's both funny and heartbreaking at the same time. And it's packed to the brim with social commentary about the impact on and of family and about how wealth inequality leads to inequality of care and so much more. It's so smart and to be completely honest, quite terrifying. So if you do read this, Go into it knowing that you are going to be confronted with this pretty scary reality of what it's like to go through dementia or see that in a loved one. I think this is a really masterful piece of writing by Otsuka. I love the layers, the experimentation with the different styles, the humour, the astute observations of the smallest personal traits right up to the biggest societal challenges we face. It packs so much into such a small package and I think it is absolutely worth your time. I really loved it and I would definitely recommend spending a weekend with this story. Hopefully you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do give it a thumbs up as it really helps my channel out. And if you'd like to see more of my videos, I aim to publish like one a week. So if you hit the subscribe button, those will start appearing in your subscriptions feed. If you've read any of these books, I'd love to hear what you thought of them down in the comments. And do let me know what your favorite books from August and September were. But until next time, toodles.